we began to study Hebrews, uh, particularly in chapter 6, for example. Uh, but we started there uh, with the idea of pressing on to maturity and moving on to 7 and 8. Now we're in chapter 9, where we speak about the fact that Jesus entered the holy places. Now, pressing on to maturity is the thing that the scriptures outline there after having first told us what the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ are. And uh, again, I remind you that there's a whole series of lessons about those kinds of things available on uh, the internet, southaustinchurchofchrist.org. Uh, and South Austin has a YouTube channel now too that has the sermons on it. So it depends on, or I guess... It's available however you try to get it. Whatever's easy is all we're trying to do. <laughs> but I recommend that you take a look at that because the elementary principles, as the Bible outlines them, are not necessarily the elementary principles that you hear about all the time. But we're pressing on to the maturity, which is to say, how do we read the Old Testament? And one of the foundational principles there is in chapter 8, when he says Moses was told to make everything according to the pattern he had seen on the mountain. That tells us that the Old Testament is a pattern. It was not intended to, to be the end of things. It was intended to be a pattern of the real things, a copy or a shadow, a foreshadow of the real things. So maturity is knowing how to read the Old Testament and understanding the spiritual truths that underlie those symbols. Here we are speaking in uh, the end of eight, the start of nine, of a new covenant, which is a, a quote in reference to, to uh, what Jeremiah had written, that he would place a new covenant into, uh, into their hearts and into their minds, not like the covenant he made with their fathers on Mount Sinai. So the, it was never intended to be the final covenant. There was another one coming. Even according to Jeremiah, there was another one coming. In speaking of a new covenant, Hebrews 8.13 says, He makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness, a place of holiness, albeit an earthly one. It's really the way we're saying this. So the first one is becoming obsolete, but we still use it to learn. And that first one had, as he says, regulations for worship, and it had a place of holiness, albeit an earthly one. This uh, is our focus now, that the first one foreshadows the coming, the new First thing we ought to talk about is the things that he says we can't talk about. And I'd like to comment on that as well. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. And I've heard a lot of people say, well, that's because of, uh, you know, that's for lack of time. He would have expanded on this if he had had more time. I don't think it is. I think it's for lack of access. Hebrews 9 uh, verses 2 through 5, a tent was pre prepared in the old the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. So in the first tent, there is a first section and there is a second section. And in the first section, we have three items because three is spiritual. Three is heavenly. A lampstand, a table, and a bread of the presence. And this place is called holy because it's the tent of God. Once you get inside that tent, you're in the first section, and this is where these articles are. Maybe I should do it this way. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just realizing that I can't see which one is highlighted, and I can't read the previews to tell which slide is next. <laughs> so... <laughs> Luckily, it lets me swipe, scroll, whatever you call that. Hebrews 9, 2 through 5. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place. So there's the outside of the tent. You go inside. the. If you get to go inside the tent, you're a priest. 
and you have an offering. But inside the first section are these three things, and then there's a second section inside there. There's another curtain, the veil of the curtain. Behind that second one was a second section, the most holy place. So the tabernacle itself is a holy place. But inside of the holy place, there's the most holy place. What did that thing have? Well, inside of that was a golden altar of incense, an ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold. Inside the ark, there was the, a golden urn holding the manna, which God had them preserve when they got to the land of Canaan, you may recall. He fed them with manna, but manna stopped when they got to the place, the, the, uh, the uh, promised land, and they collected some in this golden urn to hang on to for posterity. Aaron's staff that budded, the budding rod of Aaron being a, it's an almond blossom, but the symbol from number 16 and number 17 about the fact that God had chosen the Levites to be the priests and there was not another priesthood, that was the priesthood. And the tablets of the covenant that Moses brought down. These also were inside of this box, which is translated ark, but it's a box. The same thing's true for Noah's ark. It's a box. Um, this is a golden box inside of which you got a golden urn that has the inside of which there is this manna that God made. And the name of manna is Hebrew for what is it? It was a, a mystery in some sense. They didn't know what this was. They hadn't seen anything like it. But it's interesting that inside the tent, there's a curtain. And inside the curtain, there's a box. And inside the box, there's an urn. And inside the urn, there's a, what is that? <laughs> it's just showing us that, man, we are far removed from heaven. That's all. <laughs> Aaron's staff that buds and the tablets of the covenant. And it's the provision of God, right? The provision of God, the priesthood and selection of God, the holiness, and the law of God. These things very clearly typified or symbolized inside the Ark of the Covenant, the box of the agreement. Right? Today, we, maybe we would, we would describe a lockbox that contains a contract. This is all it is. This is the contract, the lockbox of the contract with God. There's a, they have a priesthood. They have the ability to have mediation and some kind of forgiveness with God. They have a law to abide by, the agreement between a, a God and man, right? And God provides for them. He's their benefactor. Above the Ark of the Covenant, on the lid of the Ark, you have the structure or the, uh, the sculpture also of gold, of cherubim, cherubs of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat, uh, which is not a seat. It's just a spot. It's a place on earth that nobody can ever look at. That's all. Because it's covered in the wings of the, uh, of the uh, cherubs. There's one on one side of the box and there's one on the other side of the box and they face each other and they spread their wings out and touch the tips, meaning there's space above the Ark of the Covenant, above the box that nobody can ever look at. You can't see it. And that's the seat of mercy. There's not a direct access to God is what we're getting. You can't look directly at God and live. Of these things, we cannot now speak in detail. I don't think he's saying we're out of time. He's saying quite literally, they're gone. They're gone. They've been gone for a long time, actually. They were already gone in the Old Testament days. Um, the ark was carried away by Babylon. Babylon. Its stuff was melted, surely. Uh, how do they do that safely when it you know, was known to, to kill the people who touched it? Well, they weren't the first. The Philistines did the same. You may remember when somebody had the bright idea to carry the ark into battle. 
the Philistines got a hold of the thing and they had it for a long time. Now, it, God cursed them because of it, but they didn't die touching it. Why? Because they're Gentiles. They didn't know the law. <laughs> and I know, I know, all the Bible scholars say it's because it was electrical and the way it was, uh, it was configured would create a, a shock and therefore anybody who touched it died, except for all the people who touched it and didn't die. Again, Bible scholars don't know what the Bible says. They talk about it as though they know something, but they don't know anything about what the Bible says. So no, that stuff's gone. And then the stuff that they made when they came back from captivity in Babylon may or may not have been accurate in terms of a replica of what was there before. There were some people who were old enough to remember the first, you may recall, but it's not clear whether any of those people were priests. And certainly the high priest who was there at the time of the invasion is not there now at the time of the rebuilding. So there's no way that anybody knew with precision what the original looked like. Um, we do have a replica of the, the copy that was made, presumably the copy that was made when they came back from Babylon in the, uh, in the uh, Ark of the Triumph of Titus, the Titus Arch. Uh, has, you know, it's, a, it's got a relief, it's a stone relief all around of the parade of the captive Judah and all the treasures that were in the, in the um, temple that they took are portrayed there. You can see this is what the ones that they made look like. Probably there were some other invasions in between. It's possible that those were themselves copies of the copies that had been made on the return from Babylon. But eh. regardless, when he says we can't speak of these in detail, I think it's because the details are lost. They hadn't been around for a long time. It's arguable that those things weren't even there when the first tabernacle, the first uh, temple was still standing. Were they still in the ark when they got it back from Philistia? It is not clear. So a, a lot of things there. All of that to say the purpose of saying this is not that, hey, we're out of time. We invite you to spend a lot of time trying to guess what these things look like. That's not the point, right? It's clear what he means by this, which is to say, this is the trope. That's all you need to know about this. <laughs> this is enough symbolism for us to see the big picture, which is that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing. There is not open access to the holiest of holies. That's Hebrews 9, verses 6 through 10. So we speak of all of that being preparation, you know, the making of the tabernacle, the, the, making, the pattern, the instructions that were given. This is a preparation. When that's done, then the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties. So when they are making their offerings, they are going into that first section on a regular basis. This is what they do as priests. And when people bring offerings, that's what's happening. But there is another section, as we just said, the second section, the holy, the most holy place. Only one person ever goes in there, the high priest. And the high priest only goes in there once a year on the day of atonement. And he doesn't just go in there. He has to make an offering, an appropriate offering, as is outlined in the scriptures about the Day of Atonement. There has to be an appropriate offering. He's, there's, it's, all, it's fully regulated. The preparation that he has to make and the kind of thing he has to do, he can't go in without blood. He has to have blood. And the blood's purpose is the offering both for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. He's got to make an offering because he is human. He has sins himself and he needs that forgiveness. He needs that blood to walk into this holiest place, even though 
the holiest place, once you get inside, is full of coverings and more layers. You're still getting, in some uh, uh, symbolic sense, closer to God. And you need more protection. So he takes the blood. It's for himself. And the offering is for the unintentional sins of the people. Which is uh, a topic we won't address at the moment. But the unintentional sins of the people is a thing. That is a, an important thing to note. Uh, the law prescribes um, basically two different things. When there's a problem, the resolution involves two different things. One is an offering, whether that be a sacrifice or a contribution, whatever it is. The other is death. Those are the two things that you can have when something is wrong. That's all that the law has. <laughs> there are offerings, you know, which includes the penalties. If you stole something, you restore it fourfold, right? But you have to make an offering for what you have done, all that kind of stuff. Those are offerings, and there's death, right? Adultery, death, kidnapping, death, rape, death, murder, death. There's nothing you can pay. There's nothing you can offer for those sins. Death, that's what it gives you. They did not have jail. <laughs> and I mean no political statement by it. I'm just saying, get in your mind. When you went to court, that was it, man. <laughs> We're walking away from here with a resolution. And that's going to be that one of these people pays either with their goods and money or with their life. That's how it is. So here, the unintentional sins of the people is an important thing to talk about because there are not any sins. When you look at Leviticus and you read about what they're talking about there and you look at the law, there are no offerings available for things that you did on purpose. There's no such thing. When you chose to sin, you knew what the law said you knew what the law taught and you chose to do this thing. You planned or premeditated, we say in modern lingo, but whatever it might be, you chose to do wrong. There's not an offering for that. There's death for that. Offerings are for accidents, unintentional things, things you didn't understand or know. Right? You don't murder somebody by accident. That's the idea. So... The offering is for unintentional sins, which this comes up later in chapter 10 when he says, if we continue to sin willfully after having the knowledge, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. And people have misinterpreted that as, well, that takes away the sacrifice of Jesus from you and you're not covered anymore. No, that's Calvinism. What he means is we've run out of offerings in the catalog. There aren't any for intentional sins. There's nothing to be done when you have chosen to do wrong. You can't be saved from that. You can't be forgiven for that. This is also what John means when he says, if you see a person committing a sin not unto death, you pray for them and God will, will uh, give, forgive them. There are things that lead to death. So, unintentional sins, moving on. The purpose of this offering, the purpose of this limited access, the singular way of doing things is the spirit indicating the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. It means today we are to understand the law of Moses is not the way to get to God. That isn't access to God. That's not access to heaven either. It's a copy, a shadow, a symbol of access to God and access to heaven. Not the real thing. That's why there are two sections. Oh, just a moment. The other thing about two sections is that two, you know, the first and the second is a recurring theme in scripture. When we're moving on to maturity, that's a thing that you should be watching for. In the Bible, 
everywhere the second overtakes the first. It happens all over the place. This is a theme in Scripture. So Cain is the first, and Abel comes, and he does better. That, that's just how it is. <laughs> right? Jacob and Esau are fighting. The second takes the first place, doesn't he? The blessing, if you will. The first king of Israel, a Benjaminite, was replaced by the second who made the lasting uh, uh, monarchy. Right? Moses doesn't get them all the way to the promised land. The second does. And by the way, the second's name is Jesus in Greek. It's Joshua in Hebrew, but it's Jesus in Greek. If you didn't know that Jesus' name is Joshua and Mary's name is Miriam. It's about as Jewish a family as you could possibly imagine. <laughs> Joseph marries Miriam and their child's name is Joshua. And uh, the others. Jude is Judah. James is Jacob. So his brothers, James and, and Jude in the New Testament are actually Jacob and Judah. All of that to say, you know, <laughs> The second is overtaking the first. Joshua overtakes Moses. Uh, and now the law of Christ overtakes the law of Moses. And it was always intended to be that way. It happens over and over and over again. That's why there's two, two spaces. There's an outer and there's the inner. And the inner is the real thing, the target in the law. Now we continue in Hebrews 9, 6 through 10. According to this arrangement then, the Old Testament arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. You've got to understand, the law of Moses is dealing with, as he says, food, drink, various washings and regulations for the body. These things are impositions of the law and their purpose is temporary until the time of reformation. And no, he doesn't mean 17th century Europe. He means when Jesus reforms in the, in the Lord, when he teaches anew and they finally understand the Old Testament. But in this arrangement, they are offering gifts and sacrifices. But these gifts and sacrifices are impotent when it comes to the conscience of the worshiper. They cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. You know, in what you find in these things, there's an offering and it's made and it gets you, if you in some sense, it gets you out of hot water. But it's still there in some sense because you have to keep doing it every year. And when Jesus comes and teaches about this, he uses the, the trope over and again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, but I say to you. And when he does this, every time you can look for them in the, in the uh, Gospels, when he does this, he's strengthening it. You've heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder, but I tell you, Whoever is angry with his brother is guilty before the Lord. So why is that? Well, because murder starts with anger. One of those is about what has been done already. And of course, people were teaching that you could do everything up until murdering. Just as long as you don't kill him, it's okay. Well, that's not true. That was never what God intended when he made that law. What Jesus says is what God intended when he made that law. But the teaching of Jesus is what cleanses the conscience. Because that's what helps us to understand the mechanism that anger is what leads to murder. But those sacrifices, those offerings, they could not perfect the conscience of the worshiper. They prescribed an antidote in some sense for what was already done 
without really explaining what you're supposed to be like, how you're supposed to think about this. And that is a weakness in the law of Moses. All right. He entered once for all into the holy places. We continue. In Hebrews 9, 11 to 15, we saw earlier that these priests were entering into an earthly tabernacle and only one priest was going into the holiest of places and only once a year. Now contrast that with Jesus. When Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, not to come, they are here. Then through the greater and the more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places. So this Jesus appears at the end of the ages in the New Testament. He is the anointed, meaning he's the king. And how does the king serve as the priest? Well, only in the order of Melchizedek, which refers back to the Psalms, which were written centuries later, after the kingdom of Israel is already established. Why would you speak about a priesthood of Melchizedek when you've already got a priesthood of Levi? And why would you refer to somebody who is both a priest and a king? This is why, because Jesus is the one who fulfills that, that uh, you know, who fills that vessel That hole that was carved by the scriptures has to be filled in. And Jesus is that that fill. He's the king and the priest. And this now is a tabernacle or a tent that is greater and more perfect. It's not the human made one. It is one in the heavens. He has entered once for all into the holy places. Meaning he doesn't do this over and again. And he doesn't need to do it another time. How does he enter? Well, he enters not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood. See, the high priest went in, you may recall, with the offerings that were made, all the different bulls and calves and whatever else was offered. That's how he did it. But Jesus went in with his own blood. He is the Lamb of God. In this way, he secured an eternal redemption. It's eternal because he's resurrected from the dead. His blood was shed once and it lasts for eternity. If the blood of goats and bulls, the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, and they did under the law of Moses, if that was good enough to sanctify for this earthly service, How much more will the blood of the anointed who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You see how much greater this is than what was before. Before you had persons who themselves were defiled with offerings of lives that were not their own, blood that was not their own, that had to be repeated, who were prevented from going on because of death. Now we have one who is the king, as well as the priest, who has entered into the holiest place once for all, who has entered with his own blood. He is the Lamb of God. But you notice here, especially how that the blood of the Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God. You see, there's Father and Son and Holy Spirit. God himself is our king and our priest, our intercessor, our savior. And what he cleanses us from is not um, the impositions of the law about food and drink and washings, regulations for the body, like whether your garments have more than one kind of thread in them. He, rather, purifies our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. His offering is that much better because we become better people. We now have a conscience. We know right from wrong. We know why. 
as much as we need to know. And that's better. This is why he is the mediator of a new covenant. Covenant is an agreement, a testament, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. So he's mediating the new covenant and all who are called are inheriting a promised eternal inheritance, not just an annual buyback in Yom Kippur, in the Day of Atonement. Not just an annual buyback, but an eternal, an eternal inheritance. The promise. What promise? The promise to Abraham. This is being fulfilled. This, this verse, 15, is looking back. Right? When we say those who are called, when we say they receive the promise, when we say the eternal inheritance, these are topics of Hebrews lead, uh, prior to this. This goes all the way back to the promise of a real inheritance in the heavens, a city whose builder is God. The other thing that we find is a will. They call it, don't they call it the last will and testament? Right. Testament, will, covenant, agreement, contract. These are all the same thing. That's the same word. It only takes effect at death. If then. <laughs> Hebrews 9, 15 to 22. Those who are called will receive the promised in eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Yes, something new is coming. Now, in human terms, when we speak of a will, a testament, we're talking about a, a line of inheritance. If, you know, um, if, for example, you are preceded in death by one of your heirs, then in some sense, what was to be theirs is now being superseded by your will as to what would happen to their, you know, what would they get from you? And so even though they had a will and a testament and a covenant in place, your covenant, your will is in some sense going to buy people back from that loss that next generation, whoever was going to inherit from them, will benefit when your will is done. If one of your inheritors died before you. And so it is here. The law of Moses has something of a promise. It's a covenant. It's an agreement. There's an inheritance that comes from that law. But when the law of Moses is taken um, uh, spiritually, it's being fulfilled in Christ Jesus and the promise granted in Christ supersedes what you were going to get from the law. It's better than what you were going to get. This death redeems from the transgressions under the first law, meaning this death takes care of everything that happened in the first one and adds more to it. Where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. A will takes effect only at death, since it's not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. This is why there is sacrifice to begin with. Agreements are not ratified without death. It has to be serious. And that's... What serious is in this world, mortality is as serious as it gets. There has to be blood or it doesn't mean anything in some sense. When every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, then he took the, book of, uh, the, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying, this is the blood 
of the agreement God has commanded for you. So he made the offering and then he used these materials, all of which are, are you know, uh, they're just, you know, ways of holding on to liquid that you can shake that will throw uh, uh, droplets. That's all. He's throwing droplets of blood and throwing them pretty far um, to cover the people and to cover the law, the book. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. So everything's got blood, you know, sprinkles all over it. There's blood everywhere. It's the agreement. And indeed, he says, in observation of the big picture, the, under the law, most everything is purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Yeah, every sin there is, is purified by means of an offering. They had to offer something. The law taught us that the price is life. The price of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. And finally, in Hebrews 9, Christ has entered into heaven itself. Here we get the real contrast. This is the end. The real contrast that they did this earthly service, but Jesus really in the spirit is doing this in heaven now. Hebrews 9, 23 to 28. In this way, then we can conclude. It was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with such rites as the ones we have just described. However, the heavenly things themselves necessarily must be purified with better sacrifices than these. Necessarily. How is it necessary? By faith. Abel knew it was necessary that God must have the best. That's why he offered the best. And Cain was not accepted because he just offered. He didn't offer the best. He did offer, but that's not enough. The heavenly things must be purified with better sacrifices than the earthly things command. Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the real things. Christ has entered into heaven itself, now appearing in the presence of God on our behalf. This is the thing, you know, you're thinking to yourself, boy, it would be really interesting to walk into that tent in ancient Israel. And it would be interesting. But... That's nothing like what Jesus has done. Standing up from among the corpses, getting up after death and ascending into heaven and entering the throne room of God, being seated at the right hand of God. He appears in the presence of God on our behalf. And when we compare him to the old, it wasn't to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood that is in his own blood. Then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world, but not so. As it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He only has to do it once because he has an, an eternal, indestructible life. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, after that comes the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So when he comes back again, it won't be so that he can offer himself again or make any other kind of sacrifice for sins. It will be so that he can save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And that's where we come to our... Uh, discussion of God's invitation that you should obey the gospel of Jesus. Are you eagerly waiting for him or are you waiting in dread for him? I hope that you're eager for his return, at which time all good blessings come to those who have loved him. Yes, in every way, it's better to be with Christ. Today, are you a Christian, a child of God? There's water here prepared that you might be baptized in his name for forgiveness of sins. 
Nothing should stop you from serving God and becoming a child of God, and we want to help if we can. Today, if you are already a child of God but have not lived right, let us pray that you might be restored to him. Let us help you with our prayers on your behalf. We need prayers too, all of us do. Remember that Jesus intercedes on our behalf for real, in the real heaven, with a real offering that is a real eternity, and that heaven is coming soon. This life is just a short ride. Don't get comfortable. Prepare for the next one. That's the right way to live. Today, if we can help you to obey the gospel, if we can help you with our prayers, please let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing. Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior. Trying to